Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. New week, new conflict, this time in South Asia. It's Pakistan versus Afghanistan. Pakistan has carried out airstrikes on Afghan soil. It has bombed two places in Afghanistan. Kabul has responded. Tonight, we'll tell you where this is heading. Will it be an all-out war? Can either side afford it? Meanwhile, there's a battle for batteries and China seems to be winning it as the US works on its next moves. Elsewhere, Europe is being its hypocritical self, lecturing the world about democracy but showering autocrats with money to keep migrants at bay. In Russia, Vladimir Putin has won a record fifth term in office. What will it change for Moscow and the world? In Japan, the world's last negative interest rate regime is ending. What does it mean? Why is Tokyo doing it now? Is Apple working on a deal with Google to get artificial intelligence in iPhones? Schools teach children to avoid junk food. Why do they... Why do school canteens sell it then? How the Indian Navy carried out a 40-hour operation and captured Somali, Somali pirates. Why Iceland has declared an emergency over a volcanic eruption. And what's Forgive Mom and Dad Day? We'll discuss the headlines first. In India, opposition leader Rahul Gandhi is on the back foot after attacking the government using the word Shakti, which means might. Prime Minister Modi says India's women personify Shakti. The ruling BJP calls Gandhi's remark misogynistic. The Congress leader claims the government is twisting his words. Israel's spy chief to hold talks with Qatari Prime Minister on Gaza truce, say sources. These talks in Doha are the first since mediators failed to secure a truce before Ramadan. Earlier, Hamas had demanded that Israel withdraw from Gaza completely, but now they're willing to accept a partial retreat to agree to a truce. At least 16 soldiers killed in Nigeria. They were responding to a distress call during a clash between two communities. The attack took place in the oil-rich Delta state. President Bola Tinubu has ordered a manhunt to bring the perpetrators to justice. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi on a rare visit to New Zealand. This is the start of his diplomatic blitz through New Zealand and Australia. It's Wang's first visit to either country since 2017. The focus will be on trade as Beijing battles economic slowdown at home. And Cubans stage rare protests over food and electricity shortages. Some places in the island are without power for 14 hours a day. The cash-strapped nation has also hiked the fuel, fuel price by more than 400%. Cuba is facing its worst economic crisis since the 1990s. Breakups can be ugly. There can be a lot of shouting, a lot of emotions, maybe even some salty messages. But this breakup has taken it to the next level. It involves fighter jets, airstrikes and terrorism. I'm talking about Pakistan and the Taliban. They're both clashing again. The Taliban says Pakistan bombed two Afghan areas. The first was Barmal in the Paktika province. The second was Sepera in Khost. Now, both provinces border Pakistan. The Taliban says Pakistani planes flew in at around 3 a.m. local time, dropped bombs in two places, then flew back. And casualties? Around eight people have been killed. The Taliban claim that they were women and children. And what is Pakistan saying? Well, they have admitted to carrying out airstrikes, but not in Afghanistan. Islamabad says this operation was inside Pakistan. They claim eight terrorists were killed. Now, the motive is pretty clear. Pakistan suffered a terror attack over the weekend. A military post in Waziristan was attacked. Around seven soldiers were killed and two of them were officers. Now, this attack was later claimed by a new terror group. It's called Jaish e Fursan e Mohammed. Pakistan says this group is based in Afghanistan and the Taliban shields them. So, a response was always on the cards. A funeral for the slain Pakistani soldiers was held on Saturday. President Asif Ali Zardari and Army Chief Asim Munir attended it. Both men appeared quite involved. Take a look at this.
मैं आपसे ये वादा करता हूँ कि ये मेरे बेटों का खून रागा नहीं जाएगा और हम इस खून का खराज लेंगे इनसे सबसे खराज लेंगे पाकिस्तान ने यह तय कर लिया है कि जो भी हमारे सर्दों पे या हमारे घर में आके या हमारे मुल्क में आके जो भी टेररिज्म करेगा हम उसका मुंह तोड़ जवाब देंगे सो देर वॉज अ वार्निंग पाकिस्तान प्रेजिडेंट हिंटेड एट मिलिट्री रिस्पॉन्स एंड ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स लेटर इट केम बट हाउ इज दालिबान रियक्टिंग टू इट Their statement makes for an interesting read. Let me quote from what the Taliban has said: "We have a long experience of freedom struggles against superpowers. We do not allow anyone to invade our country." This is the Taliban saying: "Pakistan should not blame Afghanistan for the lack of control, incompetence, and problems in its own territory." How about that? The Taliban says Pakistan is incompetent, and it's not just words. They are hitting back militarily too. There were reports of a gunfight near the border apparently the Taliban fired at Pakistani military targets so it's a cycle of tit for tat attacks but how did things descend to this level and what happens next let's go all the way back to 2021 pakistan supported the taliban's conquest of kabul they urged the global community to work with the taliban to give them aid but soon the equation changed Pakistan needed the Taliban's help to contain the TTP that's Tehreek-e-Taliban Pakistan basically the Pakistani Taliban their goal is to establish an Islamic caliphate in the country how by toppling the current regime but these Taliban have ethnic ties most of their rank and file are Pashtuns so Pakistan hoped the Taliban would use their influence maybe reign in the TTP but the opposite has happened A United Nations report has detailed this nexus it says the Taliban is arming and funding the TTP they're setting up training camps giving them aid packages and also shielding them from Pakistan and the data supports this some 650 attacks were reported last year they killed almost 1000 Pakistanis around 93% of these attacks were in two provinces Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and what's special about them both provinces border afghanistan so you can join the dots here the taliban is giving a safe haven to the ttp and what has pakistan done about it in 2022 they launched similar air strikes around 47 afghans were killed in the bombing then afghan refugees were deported there are 4 million of them in pakistan around 1.7 million were ordered to leave again the idea was to build pressure on kabul but no luck Finally Pakistan complained to, to the United Nations they asked the United Nations Thank Security you. Council President. to act against the Taliban again no luck because the international community has moved on they may criticize and condemn but they're not coming to save Pakistan which raises the question what next well this pakistani regime looks weak the civilian government is deeply unpopular and the army's foothold has eroded In January, the Iranians flew into Pakistani airspace. They bombed a border town in the west. So the regime had to send a message, a strong and symbolic message that Pakistan is capable of defending itself. Allahu Akbar. Hence this air strike on Afghanistan. At the same time, they may not want an escalation. Why else would they deny striking inside Afghanistan? So the next move is the talibans they have a lot of options to choose from the easiest would be another proxy attack to unleash the ttp again but either way it's a lesson for pakistan's generals they backed the afghan taliban as good terrorists they fought the pakistani taliban as bad terrorists and now look at them both good and bad have joined hands and together they're bleeding pakistan i'm afraid islamabad is alone in this battle not because the world doesn't care about terrorism we do but because pakistan is responsible for this mess their deep state funded and armed terror groups there's no point complaining now what are the biggest names in ev you'll guess the the easy ones of course like tesla or byd those are car makers though what about the units that power those cars i'm talking about batteries it's equally important if not more and one country is monopolizing this industry that country is china just look at this list the top 
Battery makers for electric vehicles. At number one is CATL. It stands for Contemporary Amperex Technology Limited, CATL. Chances are you've never heard of this company. But look at its, its market share. It's almost 37% as of last year. One out of three batteries sold are made by this company, CATL, and its clients are the likes of Tesla, Volkswagen, and BMW. At number two on our list is BYD. They have around 16% market share. Now guess what's common between these two firms? CATL and BYD, both are Chinese. Together, they make up 53% of all EV batteries. So randomly take two electric vehicles, one of them will have a Chinese battery. Do you see why that's a problem? Going forward, most vehicles are expected to be electric, and those vehicles will need batteries. If China controls that market, it gives them power. They can choke rival countries or drive up prices or use the batteries as a bargaining chip, a bit like the Gulf does with oil. So what are other countries doing? The U.S. is pressuring local car makers, for example, Ford. CATL and Ford struck a deal to build batteries in Michigan. But American politicians opposed it. So Ford is scaling back this project. The factory's proposed capacity has been cut by 40%, 4 zero. But why not ban it completely? Why not remove Chinese batteries from the markets altogether? Because alternatives are few. You see, China has played the long game here. They've made themselves indispensable in this industry. And they've done so with three steps. The first was acquiring raw materials. In this case, the raw material is lithium. It's a silvery metal used to make batteries. Now, China has around 8% of the world's lithium. The rest they're buying. In the last two years, China has bought stakes in 20 lithium mines, 2-0. Most of them are in Africa and Latin America. So that's raw material check. The next step is refining it. Again, China has a head start. In the last four years, the world has spent $300 billion on battery factories. China made up 74% of that. So that's processing, also check. The final step was helping these battery makers flourish. They've been given massive state subsidies. In fact, CATL topped the list. They got $391 million in six months. So naturally, they're ahead. Experts say American firms will take five to ten years to catch up. Imagine that, a whole decade just to catch up. So the world finds itself in a tough spot. On the one hand, you need EVs, and by extension, you need batteries. On the other, you cannot bet on Chinese supply chains. They're simply not reliable. So what's the solution? One is to use regulatory powers to legally reduce the dependence on Chinese batteries. China may complain at first, but eventually they'll have to agree. After all, a lot of money is at stake. Beijing has invested billions of dollars in this industry. Eventually, they will want returns, which is why the likes of CATL are striking a conciliatory tone. They've denied collecting or sharing American data. The second solution is to think domestic, to build your own battery factories. Let's consider India. We import 100% of our lithium. Basically, there is no domestic production. Out of these imports, 95% is from China. So New Delhi is looking to diversify. In January, the government decided to invest $24 million in Argentina. The plan is to develop five lithium mines there. Of course, all of this is going to take time. Most experts say it could take at least a decade. But it's important to work in this direction. It's never ideal to keep buying critical resources from abroad. And in this case, the supplier is not even your ally. It's a strategic rival in China. So expect the battle for batteries to heat up in the coming years. Now let's turn our attention to Egypt. Their president is Abdel Fateh al-Sisi. He's a former military man. He even reached the rank of field marshal before opting for a different career. In 2013, he decided to take over his country, Abdel Fateh al-Sisi. He orchestrated a coup and he ousted Egypt's first democratically elected president, a certain Mohamed Morsi. Al-Sisi took power, won a presidential election the following year and has ruled since 2013. The man he dethroned was put in jail and he died there in 2019. After hearing all of this, what do you think about Abdel Fateh al-Sisi? Not exactly a champion of democracy, right? 
at least according to the Western definition of democracy, you may expect the West to despise El Sisi, impose their usual sanctions on him, or even plot regime change in Egypt. But the exact opposite is happening. The West is showering El Sisi with gifts. Today marks a historic milestone with the signature of our joint declaration for a strategic and comprehensive partnership. It is a partnership based on six main pillars, six areas of mutual interest for Europe and Egypt. And I'm pleased to announce that this will be supported by a new financial and investment package of 7.4 billion euros for the coming four years. The European Union has promised Egypt $8 billion. $8 billion. It will be in the form of grants, concessional loans and other funds. This payout will take place over the next four years. The EU has also upgraded their relationship with Egypt. It is now a strategic partnership. Now, considering what we know about Egypt's past, all this may come as a shock. But there's a reason why the EU is humoring Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. It's something they view as an existential threat. We agree on a package ranging from trade and investment to low carbon energy, managing migration. Partners in eliminating irregular migration. Or whether it comes to cooperating in issues such as uh, uh, migration. This initiative is also the best way to tackle the migration challenge. Illegal migration, that's the reason El Sisi is getting paid. He has served the EU well. He has stopped migrants from using Egypt as an exit ramp. And for this, he is being rewarded. Everything else is just a whitewash. The EU is prepared to forgive anything and everything if it means they can stem the tide of migrants. Abdel Fattah El Sisi is not the first to be rewarded like this. In December, the EU signed a similar deal, a similar migration deal with Tunisia. Tunisia is led by President Kai Said, another authoritarian. He has cracked down on press freedom, opposition politicians and Tunisia's judiciary, but he has also cracked down on Europe-bound migrants. So guess what the EU is choosing to focus on? It's the same story in Mauritania. The EU signed a migration partnership with this country earlier this month. Guess who the Mauritanian president is? This man, Mohamed Ould Razuani. He's a former chief of army staff. He was part of Mauritania's ruling military junta twice. Razuani helped oust presidents twice. And his immediate predecessor is in jail. After all of this, the European Union is giving this country millions of euros. What happened to the ethics and morality that the West is always touting? And look, we understand that prag pragmatism trumps rhetoric. We know that sometimes you have to do unpleasant th things for the greater good. Everyone does it. But that's not the real issue here. It's the blatant hypocrisy that is gut-wrenching. Together, we will also work on our commitment to promote democracy and human rights. That was the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. She says the ideal, the, the deal with Egypt, rather, will, and I'm quoting, promote democracy and human rights. Is she trying to convince us or herself? Either way, no one is buying it. This is what we mean by European hypocrisy. They'll say all this nonsense and go ahead and pay off authoritarians. It's why their reputation is in tatters and why no one really wants to listen to Western lectures. They keep proving time and again that they do not practice the democratic values that they preach. Now let's look at Russia and President Vladimir Putin. A leader the West does not hesitate to criticize. Putin has won Russia's presidential election again. This will be his fifth presidential term. He's set to become the country's longest serving elected leader. He will even surpass Joseph Stalin before this term is up. And far from anti-incumbency, Putin's popularity is on the rise. He won the election with a record 87% vote share. So what does this mean for Russia, for the war in Ukraine, and the bigger geopolitical picture? How will Putin's expected victory impact the world? Here's our report. Polling closed in Russia yesterday. After three days of voting, Russia picked its next president. 
Of course, the results were never in doubt. With a resounding 87% in early counting, Vladimir Putin returned with another landslide. He will be Russia's president for a record fifth term. First of all, I want to thank the citizens of Russia. We are all one team. All the citizens that came to polling stations and voted. Once again, I want to say this is very important. This has no formal character. The source of authority in the nation is the Russian people. He thanked the people of Russia, but Putin's opponents have slammed the polls. They called the election a sham. We have seen the Russian elections, and stemming from the 27 will be issued uh, uh, after the council. But I want to anticipate that this has not been free and fair elections. The EU says the elections weren't free or fair. British Foreign Minister David Cameron agreed. German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock called it an election without a choice. The US and other Western nations will add their two cents soon enough. But so far, the harshest criticism has come from, no prizes for guessing, Ukraine. There is not a single bit of legitimacy in this simulation of an election, and there cannot be. This actor should be on trial in The Hague. It's expected that Zelensky would be furious. He is losing the war. To add insult to injury, Russia held voting in the annexed parts of Ukraine, via a ballot bus in some places. So it seems Putin has no intention of returning the annexed land. He considers them Russian citizens and voters now. Putin even spoke about creating a buffer zone between Ukraine and Russia, using present Ukrainian territory. Meaning, Ukraine still has a long fight ahead of it. That's why Zelensky seems angrier than usual. But while Russia's enemies seethe with rage, Putin's allies sent their congratulations. With more than 87% votes, Putin has completely won the war against the entire collective empire of the West. China congratulates on this. China and Russia are each other's largest neighbors and comprehensive strategic partners in the new era. We firmly believe that under, that under the strategic guidance of President Xi Jinping, and President Putin, China-Russia relations will continue to move forward. Putin also said that China-Russia ties would continue to grow, which is more bad news for the West. The Russian president has won a resounding mandate. It will embolden him to stick with his current path. Unless the West finds a way to get along with Russia, the world may be in for a rough few years. Japan is preparing for a massive change. The central bank is meeting today and tomorrow. At the end of it, a major decision is expected, one that could shake up Japan's economy. And what is that decision? Japan is ending its negative interest rates. Now bear with me for a minute. All of us know how interest rate works. Say you deposit $1,000 in your account and the bank interest is 10%. Then you get $100 as interest. That's how it normally works. But negative interest is the opposite. Let's take Japan's case. Their interest rate is minus 0.1%. So you won't be paid money for your deposits. Instead, you will have to pay the bank to keep your money there. How much? In this case, 0.1% of $1,000. That's the negative interest rate. 0.1% of $1,000 is $1. Now, I know you have questions, so let's break this down into three parts. First of all, why did Japan have this weird system? Second, what are they, why are they changing it? And three, what will it mean? Negative interest is a policy tool of central banks. They use it to fight falling prices. Now, you may be wondering, what's wrong with that? Isn't lower prices good for consumers? Well, in the short run, yes, but over long periods, no, it's not good. When prices fall, companies make less money. After all, their products are now cheaper, so they're making less money. And when companies make less money, they cut down production. Less production requires fewer jobs, so eventually you will see layoffs. 
Your economy will flatline and that's what Japan was experiencing. In the 1990s, they fell into a recession. There was a stock market and real estate crisis in Japan. Most Japanese banks reported massive losses. So afterwards, they had no money to lend. This led to a gradual fall in money supply and circulation. And the end result? Deflation, meaning prices decreased over time. Another factor is Japan's work culture. The first priority for most Japanese employees is job security. Not a massive bonus, not a double-digit hike. Most of them just want security. As a result, companies hold back on raises. Again, the end result is the same. Less spending, less inflation. To combat this, Japan entered negative interest rates in the year 2016. And the idea here was quite simple. Force banks to keep lending more. Force people to spend more. Basically, do anything but park your money in bank accounts. Some European banks have also tried this back in the 2010s. But today, there is only one negative interest regime in the world, and that is Japan. So why are they changing it now? Because Japan's wish has come true. They finally have inflation. Prices rose by almost 2% in January. It was the third straight month of inflation. One reason for that is geopolitics, the wars in Ukraine and West Asia. Both have driven up energy prices around the world. And Japan does not have its own energy. Around 90% of their oil is from West Asia. Now, as the prices rose, so did Japan's inflation. Another reason is the record wage hike. Every year, Japanese companies negotiate with workers' unions and they decide on their salary hike. This year, it's 5.28%. That's the wage hike. It's the biggest in more than 33 years, 5.28%. All the big companies are on board this time, like Toyota Motors. They've announced their largest pay hike in 25 years. But how will this help inflation? Well, more income equals more spending. More spending equals more inflation. So Japan's central bank is now optimistic. They feel confident enough to increase the interest rate, to exit the negative interest regime. Like I said, the current rate is minus 0.1%. The plan is to increase it to 0.1%. Which brings us to the final question. What will be the impact of this move? Well, it's good news for the companies and banks. If prices rise, companies will make more money and that money will fund corporate expansion. We're talking more jobs, more investments. It could rescue Japan from its economic rut. Until 2024, Japan was the third largest economy in the world. But in January this year, it slipped to the fourth spot. Germany took the third rank. And that too in the middle of a recession. So Tokyo needs to jumpstart its economy. Let's see if, existing, if exiting the negative interest regime helps them do that. Our next story is about an unlikely union, Apple and Google. Two tech rivals are looking to collaborate. Apple wants to use Google's AI chatbot on iPhones. It is in talks to license Gemini, and at this point, none of this is confirmed. But if it happens, it won't be a first. Samsung already uses Google's AI technology. Apple can do the same. A potential deal will give Google's AI dreams a big boost. It could be rolled out on two billion phones. Plus, it could help Apple. They've been slow with their rollout of artificial intelligence. Getting Google on board will make up for this weakness. So is it a win-win deal for the tech giants? Or is there a catch here? Our next report tells you. The year was 2012. Apple had just launched iOS 6. Everything looked familiar, but there was a glaring difference. If you went to the Maps app, it was no longer the usual Google Maps. It had been replaced by Apple Maps. This was a shock for Google. After all, the companies were close allies. But the friendship soon hit a roadblock. Google launched its own operating system. Apple did not take that well. It was called the Mapping Wars. Many people even called it the Tech Cold War. But the two companies have since come a long way. They may not always see eye to eye, but that hasn't stopped them from collaborating. The latest example being this. A new report says Apple is in talks with Google for its AI chatbot Gemini. It could license it for iPhones. Gemini could power new features in the new iPhone software. All of this is speculation for now, but talks of the deal gave both companies a boost. Alphabet shares were trading 5.5% higher. 
and Apple shares were up by almost 2%. The deal could be a win-win situation for both companies. Let's look at Google first. It has poured money into artificial intelligence. But the tech giant still lags behind in the AI race. Plus, Gemini has been accused of historical inaccuracy. It has faced backlash in India. So Google hasn't had a smooth run. If the deal is passed, Gemini could be available on over 2 billion iPhones. That would give Google's AI dreams a big boost. For Apple, it's more of a mixed bag. The positive here is that it could squash investor fears over a slow AI rollout. New iPhone models would have generative AI features. But there's also a risk here. That would mean Apple's own AI technology is not up to the mark. CEO Tim Cook has long spoken about Apple's AI dreams. He says the company is significantly investing in generative AI. Reports suggest that Apple is testing out an in-house chatbot. It's called Apple GPT. But it's believed to be inferior to other models. Using Gemini for its phones will prove just that. This isn't the first time Apple and Google have come together. Google is the default search engine in Safari. It's a deal that the companies cracked 20 years ago. Google pays Apple $10 billion every year to remain the default. So a new deal wouldn't be unprecedented. But Google isn't the only one Apple is talking to. It's also in talks with OpenAI's ChatGPT. No deal is likely to be announced in the coming months. We'll only find out when Apple rolls out its new software later this year. Do you remember your school canteen? For most of us, it was a happy place, a place to hang out, a place to chat with friends and a breather between classes. But do you remember what was served in those canteens? Chances are it was junk food, chips, soft drinks, fried, fried items, all types of packaged foods. And it's not just your school canteen, it's the case with school canteens across the globe. They serve junk food to children. In the US, the state of California wants to change that. It wants to ban junk food in schools. Food with artificial dyes and chemicals like Cheetos, Doritos, Fruit Loops and other popular snacks. They contain dyes and chemicals and the state says these ingredients are linked to health risks, so they must be banned. The bill is yet to be passed, but once it is, once it's enacted, schools can no longer serve these items. Now this is only for California. But we want to highlight this story in the hope that schools and governments across the world take note and follow suit. I'll tell you why. By repeating what you probably already know. Why junk food is a problem. And what exactly qualifies as junk? Food that contains high levels of fat, salt or sugar. It's usually low on fiber, protein and vitamins. It has little or no nutritional value. It is addictive and it spikes your energy levels almost instantly. Plus it harms your body. Junk food messes up with your concentration levels. It causes digestive problems. It's linked to diabetes and cholesterol. It can cause heart diseases, even strokes, and in some cases, even cancer. It is also linked to obesity in children. Globally, over 400 million children are overweight. 37 million of them are below the age of five. Obesity in children is a growing epidemic, and in a lot of cases, it is linked to junk food. So it is bad, and we know it but our children still consume it. It is still widely available in schools across the world. Has it ever occurred to you why? Schools teach children to avoid junk food with lessons and activities starting from pre-nursery, but the same schools offer children the same junk food in canteens. What gives? And it's not like no one has tried to change this. Some countries did try. Like in Canada, schools have banned junk food. Same with Chile. Norway restricts the availability of junk food to kids. Japan has some of the healthiest children in the world because of their society's war on junk food. But what about India? In 2020, a new directive on junk food was issued in India. It came from the FSSAI. That's the Food Safety and Security. Safety and Standards Authority of India. It's the food regulator, basically. It proposed a ban on junk food in schools. And not just in schools, at least 50 meters around schools. No ads or sales of junk food. That was the proposal. But it has changed little. Because the implementation depends on schools. Also, this directive was only for public schools. So private schools continue teaching against junk food in class 
and serving it in canteens. And even if some schools try to change it, the market is hard to resist because there's a lot of money riding on junk. India is an emerging market for junk food companies. The sale of snacks and soft drinks has almost tripled in the last 10 years. In 2023, the sale of junk food in India crossed $30 billion. This is at the cost of your child's health. Enter any school canteen and chances are you'll be greeted by packets of chips and soft drinks. They would tempt anyone, even adults, so why blame children? A child's food choices are influenced by their environment. If junk food is available, chances are they'll eat it. Which is why schools play a crucial role here. They must be healthy places. They must shape healthy food habits. They must help improve children's diets, which means regulation is the only way to go. Schools are the building blocks of a child's life. It's time they walk the talk on healthy eating. Our next story is from the Indian Ocean. The Indian Navy has proved itself yet again here. They conducted a daring anti-piracy operation, an operation that lasted 40 hours. The target was a ship captured by Somali pirates. A Maltese-flagged bulk cargo vessel called the MV Ruin. The ship was captured by Somali pirates back in December. For months, they were holding the crew hostage until Saturday. That's when the Indian Navy sprung into action. They rescued the crew and captured 35 pirates. The pirates are now being brought to India, where justice will be dispensed. Here's our report. The Indian Navy has pulled off a daring rescue. It has reiterated its position as guardian of the Indian Ocean. This weekend, the Navy saved the lives of 17 people. 17 people who had been captured by a horde of Somali pirates. It was a daring rescue. It took 40 hours and a little help from the Indian Air Force. Here's how it went down. On December 14th, Somali pirates had captured this ship, the MV Ruin. It's a bulk cargo carrier. It was carrying steel. It was sailing near the Yemeni island of Socotra. That's where the pirates struck. They captured the ship and held its crew hostage. It was the first time Somali pirates captured a ship since 2017. The pirates turned the MV Ruin into a mothership, effectively a base of operations to launch further attacks from. All this happened in mid-December. The crew was held hostage for over three months, and the world struggled to do much because they were being used as human shields. But the Indian Navy was watching. It has been monitoring the Ruin all this time waiting for the perfect opportunity, and that opportunity arose over the weekend. On Friday, the Ruen was intercepted by the INS Kolkata Guided Missile Destroyer. Backing up the INS Kolkata was a patrol vessel, the INS Subhadra. The rescue squadron also comprised of P-8I long-range maritime patrol aircraft and maritime spotter drones. This squadron intercepted the Ruen the Indian Navy issued a warning, telling the pirates to surrender and release the hostages. But the pirates responded by firing at the Indian Navy. They even shot at one of the Navy's drones, which had approached the ship to conduct reconnaissance. And that was their biggest mistake. The Indian Navy could now act in self-defense. The 40-hour mission had begun. The Indian ships cornered the Ruen. Warning shots were fired. The Indian Navy kept telling the pirates to surrender, but a second prong of the operation was also underway. An Indian Air Force C-17 Globemaster transport craft was being readied. Indian Marine Commandos, or Marcos, boarded the plane. After a 10-hour flight, the forces were above the pirate ship. And then they executed a precision airdrop. The commandos were dropped near the pirate vessel as were two raiding boats. This allowed the Indian Navy to close in on the pirates and eventually board the ship. The 35 Somali pirates were captured, the 17 crew members were rescued and the Indian Navy pulled off a heroic feat. Uh, we are uh, investigating all uh, suspicious vessels which have a piracy trigger uh, and this uh, ongoing operation. So while doing this, we came across this MV Ruin, which was being used as a uh, pirate mothership. So the pirates have surrendered. There were a crew of 17 personnel on board. 
seven from Bulgaria, one from Angola, and uh, nine from uh, Myanmar. So they are all safe, and uh, the ship is now being sent back to uh, to its next port of call. The Ruan was run by a Bulgarian company. You can imagine how pleased Bulgaria is now that both the crew and the ship are free. Bulgaria's deputy prime minister thanked the Indian Navy for its heroics, and she received a warm reply from India's external affairs minister. This is the latest incident which proves how India is working hard to secure our seas. And our Navy is at the forefront of that endeavour. Our next story comes from the land of fire and ice, Iceland. So this week, the Nordic nation is making news for its fire. A volcano erupted in southern Iceland on Saturday. It happened with little notice and unleashed a string of eruptions in the area, leading the authorities to declare a state of emergency. This is the fourth volcanic eruption in the region since December. While such eruptions are common in Iceland, this is one of the biggest in the region since 2021, and it poses a big risk to geothermal infrastructure. Here's a report. Blaring sirens, an orange-hued dark sky, plumes of smoke, and glowing magma oozing out of it. What seems to be the gates of hell opening up is a scene from the land of fire and ice, Iceland. A volcano erupted in southern Iceland on Saturday night, the fourth in the region since December and one of the biggest since 2021. Lava fountains burst out of the ground near the town of Grindavik, home to about 4,000 people, and the Blue Lagoon, one of Iceland's most famous tourist attractions. Residents and visitors were evacuated shortly after the eruption. I've never experienced anything like that before. The eruption happened with little notice. According to the Meteorological Office, the indications were received about 40 minutes ahead of the eruption, and the first warning was sent only moments before the eruption. So this was definitely expected. There had already been uh, several um, statements issued from the Icelandic, Icelandic Met Office about an imminent eruption in the area. But of course, the exact time of it uh, starting is uh, not, uh, it's not possible to predict. Authorities have declared a state of emergency. As we speak, the lava flow has slowed down in pace. So the rate of lava flow is, is getting lower and lower, it seems like, and the barriers that were built around the town, they are diverting the flow around it. Uh, most of the flow is going east of the town towards the sea, so um, it, it looks like the, the barriers are really doing the job they were designed for. However, the lava stream is still moving forward, and this poses a major threat. It's about 650 feet away from the region's water pipe. This is the distribution pipe of a geothermal plant. It provides hot water for most of the region. So this is crucial infrastructure, and the moving lava could damage it. But there's a bigger problem here. The lava is flowing southwards. If it continues to, it could reach the sea. If it comes into contact with seawater, it will become unstable, leading to minor explosions and toxic fumes. But there's not much anyone can do about it. So far, authorities hope that the lava flow stops on its own. There are risks here, but Iceland is not too worried. After all, it's not their first rodeo. Iceland is one of the most volcanically active places on Earth. An eruption occurs every three to five years. In fact, this has spawned an entirely new branch of tourism. Volcano tourism. Adventurers from all over the world fly to Iceland. They bike, hike or abseil across active volcanoes. These eruptions attract hundreds of thousands of visitors. Chances are, this volcano too will help Iceland turn its lemons into lemonade. Though waiting for that to happen can feel like playing with fire. For our last story tonight, we thought of Monday motivation and for a change it's coming from the US. The US seems to be celebrating everything and they have weird days like a beer day, a garlic day, a bobblehead day. We're not making this up. These are national days in America. They may sound silly, but there are others 
which are thought-provoking, like today. It's Forgive Mom and Dad Day. It sounds like parental agenda or pop psychology propaganda. But the U.S. observes it today on March 18th, Forgive Mom and Dad Day. No historical proof is tied to this day, but the message is quite simple. Your parents did their best most of the time. Their instincts were spot on. But sometimes they made mistakes. They perhaps did not mean to, but they did. So today you can think about it, accept it, and forgive them. Because at the end of the day, they tried their best, and that's what counts. That's the long story short, except it's not. It throws up a whole lot of questions too, like why must children forgive their parents? And if they do, what difference does it make? Does it rebuild a relationship? Does it boost connection? It's a complex problem. It was once thought that four major factors affect a child. Gender, sexual orientation, genetic relatedness to parents, and the way the child was conceived. These factors were believed to define the psychological and emotional development of children. But a few years ago, science scratched that. So apparently, they do not matter so much anymore. Now experts point to one major factor, and that is familial bonds, or the concept of family connection, the relationship between parent and child. The better and stronger the bond, the better it is for the child. If children feel accepted and nurtured at home, they can build a healthy identity. If family connections are strong, children have a high likelihood of flourishing in life. Look at this study held across 26 countries. It says a child's chances improve by 49% if family bonds are strong. So it's all about the quality of your relationship. And what affects this quality? Very few surveys are done on this. They say socioeconomic factors do not really play a big role. The age of the child does. Young children are deeply connected. Adolescents tend to have a lower quality of relationship with parents. And once you're an adult, things tend to improve again. Plus, if the parents get on well with each other, it helps the child. But again, the research is limited here, so it is dangerous to generalize. Instead, let's look at an individual case tonight. Yours. Scientists say family connection depends on five categories. Care, support, safety, respect, participation. So today we urge you to introspect, to look at your bond with your parents and grade each of these factors on a scale of 1 to 10. Care, support, safety, respect, participation. And don't expect a 10 on 10 on each factor. For that, you'll have to live inside a Hallmark movie. So be kind to yourself and your folks. Because parenthood is a fulfilling, but demanding job. Parents learn on the go. There is no manual. Well, there are, but they help only so much. So goof-ups are part of the job. But accepting them and deciding to move on is a core part of adulthood. Why? If we strip away the morality of it, simply because a body of solid research says that resentment is bad for you, it increases risk of blood pressure, depression, and other, med other health problems. It hinders academic and personal growth. It worsens the quality of sleep. It boosts anxiety. So forgiveness is good, both for you and your family, which is not to say that you have to stay in an abusive relationship or brush problems under the carpet. It just means that you develop real expectations of each other. It means you accept the past and forgive your parents. And if you are a parent, forgive yourself, because most likely you're doing your best. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Spain, thousands of protesters lie down on streets as a tribute to Gaza victims. In London, a new Banksy mural pops up beside a cropped tree. And sand boarding makes a comeback in Namibia for the first time since the pandemic. Finally, we are taking you back in history. On this day in the year 2000, Sen Soi Bian was elected president of Taiwan. He was leader of the pro-independence movement that sought statehood for Taiwan. His win ended the Nationalist Party's 55-year rule. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
Formula One. It's the pinnacle of motorsport. Fast cars, engineering marvels, and deep pockets. It's a high-speed drama, but not without its share of controversies and scandals. The latest one is plaguing Red Bull. At the center of this scandal is Red Bull team principal Christian Horner. In February, the team launched an investigation into him. The charge was potential misconduct. Details were not shared, but just days ahead of the first race of 2024, Horner was cleared. Red Bull gave him a clean chit. The saga should have ended there, but it did not. A day after, a secret Google Drive folder was emailed. It was sent to the entire grid, drivers, team principals and journalists. It contained a trove of messages, messages that Horner had allegedly sent to a female employee. Horner was accused of inappropriate behavior. No response from Red Bull. The female employee who was involved though was suspended. Two races have already happened this year. Yet this saga isn't ending. Does that mean controversy is new to F1? Not really. The sport has seen its fair share. Cheating scandals, race interferences, there's been Crashgate, Watergate. But the biggest would be Spygate. It took place in 2007. Nigel Stepney was the chief mechanic at Ferrari. It was just after the Schumacher dream era. Stepney considered himself crucial to the team. He had been promised a promotion. He waited for it. That year, he did get promoted. But the role did not match his ambitions. So, Stepney hatched a plan. He was going to leak Ferrari's secrets. Stepney took out 780 pages of confidential information from the Ferrari garage. It included the blueprint of Ferrari's new car. He gave them to a friend. But the friend was the chief engineer of McLaren, a rival F1 team, a man named Mike Coughlin. All was going well, the two would have gotten away with the leak, except Coughlin's wife was charged with photoshopping the documents. She went to a local shop. The man there was a Ferrari fan. He got suspicious. He emailed Ferrari. The whole thing then unraveled and McLaren was fined. Spygate was over, but it only gave way to another scandal, Crashgate. It was the 2008 Singapore Grand Prix. On the 14th lap, Renault driver Nelson Piquet Jr. crashed into the wall. Crashes are not abnormal in F1, but this one had a sinister purpose. The delay allowed his fellow driver, Fernando Alonso, to take the lead in the race. PK Jr. first claimed the crash was a mistake. But when he was dropped from the team, he said the team bosses made him do it. F1 has seen other deliberate crashes as well. Michael Schumacher had been accused of many. In 1994, 1997 and 2006, if he wasn't winning, Schumacher had been accused of crashing into his rivals. He wasn't the only one though. Crashes have defined top rivalries in F1. Schumacher vs Hill, Prost vs Senna, Rosberg vs Hamilton. It's how iconic rivalries have played out. But when drivers weren't going fast on the track, they were playing fast and loose with rules off it. The drivers of today may be the pinnacle of fitness, but drivers of the past did not seem to care about it. They were called the undisputed bad boys of the sporting world. Smoking, drinking, partying, they did it all before turning up for a race. James Hunt was called a playboy. He was mostly under the influence. Then there's Michael Schumacher. He once let his hair down after the fifth title. Reports suggest Schumacher stole a forklift truck. That's not all. He even threw a fridge through a window. There's also Kimi Raikkonen. He once entered a speedboat race dressed as a gorilla. Of course, Formula One has changed a lot since then. Drivers are more disciplined. Teams are respectful. There are less deliberate crashes. Less so-called gates. But in a sport that is as cutthroat and intense as Formula One, a scandal is never too far away. And this Red Bull saga shows just that.
Apple, the world's second most valued company, is under pressure. Multiple troubles have surrounded the US tech giant. Just last week, two bad reports led to over a 5% drop in Apple's share prices. Billions got wiped off from the company's market value. The worst news came from China, a crucial market for Apple. A report said that iPhone sales in China have plummeted in the first six weeks of 2024. All this while, competitors like Huawei saw a sharp rise, biting away a large chunk of Apple's market share. Apple's problems in China are not new. However, the latest report points to a brewing crisis. Last week, a report by Hong Kong-based research firm CounterPoint said that iPhone sales crashed by a massive 24% in the country. This was during the first six weeks of 2024 compared to the same period last year. This period is very significant in China. It's right before the Lunar New Year. Consumer spending usually sharply rises during this time. While Apple's sales tanked, Chinese smartphone brands saw a jump in demand. Huawei's sales surged by 64%. Honor, which split from Huawei in 2020, also saw its sales rise by 2%. Analysts say that aggressive pricing and low demand have left Apple struggling in the region. Meanwhile, Chinese brands like Huawei, Honor, Vivo, Oppo and Xiaomi are making a comeback. According to the CounterPoint report, Apple's smartphone market share in China dropped to 16% last year from 19% in 2022. Apple now ranks fourth in the Chinese smartphone market, sliding down from the second place in 2022. At the same time, Huawei has risen to the second place by capturing over 17% market share. But Apple's decline in China is no surprise. Demand for its products have been falling for a while now. Data shows Apple's sales were on a downward trajectory throughout 2023. Just in the last quarter, the iPhone maker's sales in China fell by 13% on a yearly basis. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issue, but above all, we know the player to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America. Hello and welcome to First Post America, your global pit stop for the latest news and headlines from the United States and around the world. I'm Eric Ham coming to you live from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. We'll get you a roundup of all the day's top stories, but first, let's take a look at the headlines. European Union's foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell says Israel is provoking famine and using starvation as a weapon of war in Gaza. Israel's foreign minister dismisses the accusations. Azerbaijan's president Ilham Aliyev says his country is closer than ever to a peace deal with Armenia. NATO General Secretary Jan Stoltenberg welcomes the talks between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Afghanistan's Taliban claims Pakistan carried out two strikes on its territory, killing five women and three children. Pakistan's army disputes this claim, saying it struck Taliban militants in an air raid. Unidentified gunmen kill 16 troops from the Nigerian army in the oil-rich southern state of Delta. President Bola Tanubu orders a military operation in the region. The Colombian government suspends a truce deal with Estado Mayor Centro after rebels attacked an indigenous group, killing at least one and wounding several others.
We begin with Russia, where the polls have officially closed, and no surprises, Vladimir Putin has secured a fifth term in office. In a record post-Soviet landslide, Putin won 88% of the vote, cementing his already tight grip on power. Now, Vladimir Putin has ruled Russia since the turn of the century, either as president or prime minister. And the 2024 results brought an even larger victory for Putin. His rule until at least 2030, securing a third full decade of rule. First of all, I want to thank the citizens of Russia. We are all one team. All the citizens that came out to polling stations and voted. Once again, I want to say this is very important. This has no formal character. The source of authority in the nation is the Russian people. Now, in his first speech after victory, Putin has warned the West of a third world war. The Russian president said a direct conflict between Moscow and U.S.-led NATO would mean the planet was on one step away from World War III. I think that anything is possible in the modern world. But I've already said this and it is clear to everyone that conflict between Russia and NATO will be just one step away from a full-scale World War III. I don't think anybody is interested in this. NATO military are present in Ukraine. We know this. We hear the French speech there and the English speech. There's nothing good in this. Firstly for them, because they get killed, that too in large numbers. But at the end of the day, it is not our choice. If somebody wants to cover the internal problems of their countries with their external aggressive rhetoric, well, this is a well-known and widely used trick. I would love France not to play the role which only escalates the conflict and deepens it, provokes it. But instead, like it was said here before, did something to find ways to peaceful solutions. In this sense, France could play its role, but not all is lost yet. The Russian president also criticized the United States political system and seemed to back Donald Trump in his legal troubles. You want to know my opinion regarding whether our elections are democratic or not? I believe they are democratic. And on the contrary, in some countries such as yours, you can consider the use of administrative resources to attack one of the presidential candidates, including courts. We have no preference for any of the candidates for president of the United States of America. We will work with anyone who the voters trust. But the use of administrative resources of the judicial system, well, it has become simply ridiculous and a disgrace to the whole world for the United States, for your democratic, so-called quote-unquote system. I have every reason to believe that today we do not observe any democracy in your country, at least during the election processes, in some Western countries, including the USA. Now, the landslide victory does provide Putin the rhetorical ammunition as the West is at odds over continued support for Ukraine. Some polling stations in Russia witnessed protests on the final day of voting, and supporters of deceased opposition leader Alexei Navalny called on people to protest against Putin. Now, according to reports, more than 60 Russians were detained across 16 cities on the final day of voting. But with Putin now tightening his grip on power, the room for protests in Russia is likely to shrink even further. And Russia's war in Ukraine could also spell more trouble for its ally, Iran. The G7 is mulling a ban on Iran Air, the country's national carrier for flying to Europe. The airline flies passengers from Iran to multiple cities across Europe. The United States and its allies have warned that they will slap sanctions on Tehran including a ban on Iran air if it supplies Russia with ballistic missiles. But Iran is undeterred as its officials say a deal with Moscow is in fact imminent. Our next report explains. The war in the heart of Europe between Russia and Ukraine is in its third year. U.S.-led NATO allies are weighing how to rebuild stockpiles drained by the war. They're struggling to keep up with Ukraine's increasing appetite for arms and ammunition. Russia, too, has been pumping out weapons. Its ability to churn out tanks, missiles and shells has surprised the West and mounted pressure on the Ukrainian military. 
but despite its expanding arms production, Russia has been facing major challenges. Moscow too has been struggling to replenish its dwindling supplies. To deal with this, Russia has been receiving support from one of its closest allies, Iran. Russia is reportedly seeking close-range ballistic missiles from Iran for its war in Ukraine, and Iranian officials say a deal is imminent. The United States and its G7 allies warned Iran that major Western economies will pile sanctions on Tehran if it moves forward with the deal to provide ballistic missiles to Russia. These sanctions could include a ban on Iran Air, the country's national air carrier, from flying to Europe. Iran Air flies passengers from Iran to multiple cities across Europe. As you all know, uh, we have expressed serious concerns from this podium that Russia is seeking to acquire close-range ballistic missiles from Iran to enable its brutal war in Ukraine. Uh, and that Russian negotiations to acquire those close-range ballistic missiles have been active and they've been advancing. Today, I just want to call your attention to a joint statement released this morning by the United States and other G7 countries warning Iran not to go forward with the sale of close-range ballistic missiles to Russia. The G7 statement reads in part, and I quote, were Iran to proceed with pro providing ballistic missiles or related technology to Russia, we are prepared to respond swiftly and in a coordinated manner, including with new and significant measures against Iran, end quote. So we're speaking with one voice here on this matter from the United States, Canada, Japan, the EU, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. For weeks, the Biden administration has raised alarm over a potential Russia-Iran missiles deal. The US and Europe have already imposed the most extensive and comprehensive sanctions against Iran. Tehran will reportedly provide surface-to-surface -surface ballistic missiles to Moscow for use in Ukraine. These missiles could include those from the Fateh 110 family of short-range ballistic missiles. Reports say Iran has already provided Russia with around 400 of these missiles. These shipments began in early January after multiple meetings between Iranian and Russian military officials that took place last year in Tehran and Moscow. The US is yet to confirm that missiles have moved from Iran to Russia. Washington says Iran has already provided Russia with drones, guided aerial bombs and artillery ammunition that Moscow has used to attack Ukrainian targets. Earlier, Iran had also reportedly developed a new explosive attack drone, the Shahid-107 for Russia. Well, I can't speak for the mullahs. I wouldn't do that or for the Supreme Leader. Um, we know they provided drones, not only drones, them, the, the drones themselves, but the, but the ability to manufacture drones organically inside Russia. Um, and this is a burgeoning defense relationship that we've been watching very, very closely. We've talked about it many times here. Um, they have, we, we haven't seen them move forward other than the negotiation process actively advancing. And um, we really wanted to set down a marker here for Iran and for Russia uh, that there will be swift consequences for them to do that. What, what's, in the, what's in their calculus? I, I couldn't say. But this would be obviously um, not just really bad for the people of Ukraine, but also bad for people in the Middle East, because Iran's hoping to get something out of this, too. It's not just about sales of, of ballistic missiles to Russia. They're hoping to get Russian military technology for themselves. According to reports, Tehran has already sold a few units to Moscow in a deal that is estimated to be worth more than $2 million. Iran has also supplied Russia with Shahid Kamikaze drones, which have become a staple of Moscow's long-range assaults on Ukrainian cities. Last year, Iran completed a deal to buy Su-35 fighter jets from Russia. It is also looking to buy advanced military equipment including attack helicopters, combat trainer aircraft and radars. Defense partnership between Iran and Russia has strengthened since Moscow's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Iran's hardline rulers believe this helps Tehran resist U.S. sanctions and end political isolation. And now to an update on the Israel-Hamas war. The Israeli military has launched a massive operation in northern Gaza's Al-Shifa hospital. Israel says it has received concrete intelligence that Hamas terrorists 
had regrouped inside the hospital and that there were senior Hamas operatives present who were involved in commanding attacks against Israel. Now, Israel's intelligence indicated that Hamas operatives and commanders from the northern Gaza Strip recently arrived at the hospital to use it as a command center. The IDF is conducting a high-precision operation in limited areas of Shifa Hospital, following concrete intelligence that demanded immediate action. We know that senior Hamas terrorists have regrouped inside the Shifa Hospital and are using it to command attacks against Israel. Our targeted mission isn't just an operational necessity. It's a global imperative. Now, the Israeli military also claims that the Hamas gunmen opened fire from within the hospital compound. The IDF released footage showing firing from inside the Al-Shifa hospital. The Israeli army also said that operations inside the hospital were precise and humanitarian efforts to secure patients and civilians were currently underway. Tens of thousands of displaced Palestinians have sought shelter inside the Al-Shifa complex. Our war is against Hamas, not against the people of Gaza. We seek no harm to the civilians that Hamas is hiding behind, which is why we will conduct this operation with caution and care, while ensuring that the hospital continues its important functions. For this reason, we have Arabic speakers on the ground so that we can communicate to the patients in the hospital in their own language and IDF doctors to assist those in need. We will also be conducting a humanitarian effort to provide food, water and other supplies to the patients and civilians in the hospital compound. There is no obligation for the patients and the medical staff to evacuate the hospital, but there is and will be a passageway for other civilians to exit the hospital. We call upon all Hamas terrorists hiding in hospital. Surrender immediately. Medical facilities should never be exploited for terror. Hamas must be held accountable. Now, Israel says several gunmen were killed and around 80 suspects were in fact captured. The suspects, some of whom Israel says are terrorists, are being questioned by Shin Bet interrogators. Now, the Israeli army had carried out an operation at the Al-Shifa hospital in November of last year, sparking international outcry. But Israel defended its actions, claiming Hamas was running its operations from hospitals and medical centers. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said he will continue with the military campaign against Hamas. And Netanyahu has pushed back fiercely against what he described as international pressure over the war in Gaza. He's also reiterated his determination to send forces into Rafah. To our friends in the international community, I say, is your memory so short, so quickly you forgot about October 7th, the worst massacre committed against Jews since the Holocaust. So quickly you are ready to deny Israel the right to defend itself against the monsters of Hamas. So quickly you lost your moral compass. Instead of pressuring Israel who is fighting the most just war against the most cruel enemy, turn your pressure against Hamas and its patron, Iran. They are the ones posing danger to the region and to the whole world. No international pressure will stop us from achieving all the goals of the war. Eliminating Hamas, freeing all of our hostages and ensuring that Gaza will no longer pose a threat to Israel. In order to do that, we will operate in Rafah too. Meanwhile, Israel has sent a high-level delegation headed by the Mossad chief to Qatar for talks with Hamas. The aim is to secure the release of 40 hostages in exchange for a six-week truce in Gaza. The negotiations are expected to last at least two weeks. And from the Middle East, we now turn to East Asia. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken attended the Summit for Democracy in South Korea. Secretary Blinken held bilateral talks with his South Korean counterpart in Seoul. America's top diplomat also met South Korean President Yoon suk Yo. The two leaders discussed the need to strengthen bilateral ties. They also emphasized the importance of democracies working together. 
Both President Yoon and Secretary Blinken highlighted how authoritarian regimes are using artificial intelligence to undermine democracies. As authoritarian and repressive regimes deploy technologies to undermine democracy and human rights, we need to ensure that technology sustains and supports democratic values. Fake news and disinformation based on artificial intelligence and digital technology not only violates individual freedom and human rights, but also threatens democratic systems. Meanwhile, North Korea fired multiple ballistic missiles as Secretary Blinken arrived in Seoul. South Korean military officials say the missiles were fired from a site near North Korea's capital, Pyongyang. And at least three ballistic missiles landed in the Sea of Japan just outside Tokyo's exclusive economic zone. Japan deployed its Coast Guard ships after the missiles landed near its waters. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has called North Korea's missile launches completely unacceptable. Prime Minister Kishida also went on to accuse Kim Jong-un of threatening peace in the region. North Korea launched multiple ballistic missiles today. It is estimated that they landed outside the waters of Japan's exclusive economic zone. So far, no damage has been reported. North Korea has repeatedly launched ballistic missiles quite often since the beginning of this year. A series of actions by North Korea threaten the peace and security of our country, the region and the international community and are absolutely unacceptable. The latest ballistic missile launch was a violation of related UN resolutions and we strongly condemn it. We have already lodged a stern protest against North Korea. Meanwhile, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un congratulated Russian President Vladimir Putin on winning the presidential election. In a show of friendship, Kim Jong-un rode in a limousine that was reportedly gifted to him by President Putin. The North Korean leader also inaugurated what he calls the world's largest vegetable farm. Welcome news, if true, as North Korea has struggled to feed its people for decades. Just days ago, Kim Jong-un ordered his military to prepare for war. Now, despite the food crisis, the rogue state continues to threaten the region with nuclear war. And in response, the United States, South Korea and Japan have pledged to increase their cooperation against Pyongyang. With two wars ongoing, a flare-up in the Korean peninsula would be catastrophic. And finally, to Haiti, where violence continues to engulf the Caribbean nation, a transition council that was meant to replace Prime Minister Ariel Henry has yet to be announced. Thousands of civilians are at the mercy of armed gangs. And the UN Agency for Children, or UNICEF, says Haiti looks like a scene from the film Mad Max. Will an interim government bring normalcy to Haiti? And at this point, is that even possible? Our next report goes into detail. Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, continues to burn. Gunshots, vehicles being set ablaze and lawlessness are a daily sight. This is despite Prime Minister Ariel Henry stepping down. Prime Minister Henry has not yet returned to Haiti. He continues to stay in Puerto Rico. The US has offered him asylum. Meanwhile, Haiti's neighbors are working towards bringing stability in Port-au-Prince. The transition government meant to replace Prime Minister Ori is still being formed. But experts remain uncertain about the effectiveness of the interim government. Ultimately, the formation of a, a council, a presidential council, is, is but one step in a much longer process. And, and right now it's been taking place with almost total uh, secrecy and and a lack of transparency. The only announcements have been made by foreign leaders and in English. So there's really no way for, for the broader Haitian population uh, to engage in that process in a meaningful way. And that is gonna have repercussions because whatever comes out of it is gonna face a legitimacy crisis from day one because of the process that has been put in place by those external actors. With no clear leadership in sight, Haiti continues to spiral into chaos making the Caribbean nation almost impossible to live in. 
The UN Children's Agency, UNICEF, has called the situation in Haiti post-apocalyptic, like the scenes from the film Mad Max. This comes after a ship carrying vital aid for civilians was looted by armed gangs. Ariel Henri resigned, but we are still facing political distress. I want to tell the political players that given what is happening in the country, this country is ours. No one will decide for us. We must take our destiny into our own hands. I want the political players to rise to their tasks and commit themselves to organizing the country. The situation is not good for us. We get by on the street, but nobody buys our products. We are sorry. We are almost carried away by sleep. The prices of the products are exorbitant. When we are out on the streets, people have turned against us. They don't feel comfortable. They don't live in peace. They can't even sleep at home. They can't send their children to school because they have no money to feed them. When merchants go out into the streets looking for money to feed our children and wives, we find nothing. Former cop turned gang leader Jimmy Cherizier, who started this chaos, has not been seen in action since Prime Minister Ori stepped down. The international community is watching the violence in Haiti closely. The US has begun sending charter flights to evacuated citizens. Meanwhile, Haiti's neighbor, the Dominican Republic, is taking a hardline approach. They have increased the presence of security forces at border crossings. Several migrants from Haiti who were working in the Dominican Republic were even deported this weekend. With no end to the violence, Haiti's economy continues to suffer. Businesses have been shut and people are running out of food and water. The Caribbean nation has been left without leadership. Prime Minister Ori has already abandoned Haiti. The gangs are busy fighting amongst each other and thousands of Haitians struggle for survival. It may take years until the situation in Haiti normalizes. That's our show for today. We certainly thank you for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you right back here again tomorrow. Thanks so much for watching. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America.